Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Find Your Model Health, the official podcast for those looking to optimize their long term health and weight goals and understand how their body really works. I have a very special guest with me today, like very special. But before we get into it, I'm going to remind you that the information in these episodes should not be taken as medical advice. Please consult your health practitioner before making any lifestyle changes. So today we have Dr. Sam Shea with us. Hopefully many of you will have heard of Dr. Sam Shea and his amazing work. Dr. Shea is a DCIFMCP who helps busy health conscious entrepreneurs and mompreneurs attain and sustain high performance so that they can create more freedom for themselves and others. He has dedicated his life to helping others through functional medicine and functional genetics, which we're going to get into. Dr. Shea walked his own health journey from being critically, chronically unwell from eight to 18 years, including severe fatigue, anxiety, digestive problems, chronic pain, severe insomnia, which many of us deal with, and poor nutrition. So he has dedicated his life to natural medicine to get himself and others well, which led him to functional medicine and functional testing. Dr. Shea has recently authored a new ebook, which I highly recommend you obtain, on genetics, where you can learn the different types of genetics-based weight gain, how to future-proof your brain, food triggers, how to genetically determine your optimal carb tolerance, which everyone's interested in, vitamin D absorption, immunity, and more. So you can get your free copy at Dr. Shea's website. I'll be posting links to everything in the description. But for now, welcome, Dr. Shea. How are you? Thank you. I'm really well. I really appreciate the opportunity to share this really important information with your audience. And um, I have, if you can you enable screen sharing? I can. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll talk for those that are just listening. I'll also, I'll speak in a way that it's not necessary to see the, the visual, but if you are able to watch the visual as well, along with it, it'll help uh, further, further, further ingrain the, the information on genetics. Is genetics oh, yeah. Is- it's a pretty complicated topic, uh, but my my hope is that this presentation will make it really, really straightforward because not not all weight is the same. And I think there's a lot of people here who have, you know, they've exercised and dieted. And like the, for one example, like the more, some people who are inflammatory water weight gainers, like the more they, if they the more they exercise, they sometimes get uh, fatter. Like I actually gave a, a presentation at a genetics conference on exercise induced obesity. Mm-hmm. And that seems kind of paradoxical, but the reality is, is that if people who are genetically vulnerable to be, to be pro-inflammatory, they, if they exercise too much, if they, the exercise creates excess inflammation, the body retains water to try to dilute the inflammatory damaging chemicals. And that's what people get this kind of puffy weight appearance. And what I'd like to cover during this time is the three major genetic weight types, the inflammatory water weight type, the hormonal toxic weight type, and the caloric fat weight type. So most people think weight is calories and fat, and that's actually the least common thing that I see uh, in my practice. I see the most often is the inflammatory water weight type, and then secondarily, the hormonal toxic weight type. Mm-hmm. And my, my background is that um, I have a certifications with two institutes for functional medicine, the Institute for Functional Medicine, um, and then also the Kalish Institute for Functional Medicine. And I also, uh, as a bonus, I'm also, do, I'm also a stand-up comic. And so yeah. people, um, I, I talk, uh, uh, I also have Asperger's and that's probably apparent if people listen to me for more than 10 minutes, they'll hear the, <laughs> they'll hear that, 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 that little neurological organization in my speech patterns. And uh, I do stand-up comedy. It's on my YouTube channel. I have like my latest one that I just released is about 10 minutes of what it's like to be on the spectrum. And if anyone you're listening uh, has or are watching has either themselves knows someone they care about is anyone on the spectrum they suspect is on the spectrum, I highly encourage you to watch uh, my comedy because I'm, I'm trying to explain to people about that. And I know we're talking about inflammation and 
weight and, and mitochondria stuff here today, but um, uh, health is health is a totality. There, there's yeah. all, all things wrap into it, including one's organizational thinking. So some people like me are on the spectrum. We organize our thoughts differently than the normies, uh, and how how, the, how their brains operate. And uh, obviously, there's a lot of variety amongst the two main camps. But um, one of the things that contributes to say inflammation is high stress. And if you don't understand how your brain operates within the world you've been thrust into, then stress can create all sorts of problems in the body uh, and affect digestion, affect mood, affect, uh, affect your inflammatory control because your adrenals are affected, et cetera, et cetera. So I, don't, I, I want to just kind of throw in there real briefly, uh, lifestyle and mindset is also a part of all of this. It's a part of genetics. It's a part of everything. And uh, my my journey is that I, I got into this whole thing because I was raised by a really stressed out, burnt out, unhealthy, tired mompreneur. Uh, my father uh, gave child support, um, perhaps reluctantly, and it, I was really in poor health from the super high stress environment. And I had severe insomnia to the point where I actually stunted my growth. I was a crippled insomniac from six, uh, crippling insomniac from age six to 18. I should be four to six inches taller than I am based on my shoe size, hand size, and my father's uh, height. Terrible gut issues, uh, sugar addiction, video game addiction, experienced a lot of violence in school that uh, no one did anything about, not my parents, the school, the community. I was gaslit and validated constantly. And I had chronic joint pain from the injuries I sustained. I thought back pain was normal uh, from a spinal injury, from being attacked from behind. Uh, and I just didn't know any better because I thought pain was what I always had to deal with. And it, was, it wasn't it was fun. It was a pretty terrible experience. And, and so I've used natural medicine. I was supposed to be the third generation medical doctor. Uh, instead, I took a pivot into natural medicine, uh, choosing a different doctor path and went into functional medicine. And my journey has led me into the, it's been a long circuitous journey, but my journey has led me into testing as the primary method for me to investigate what's going on. It's, it's testing and life, deep, deep lifestyle analysis. And um, the, the, the benefit of living right now in the 21st century, particularly beyond 2020, is we have access to just tremendous what are called functional tests and genetic testing right now. It's stuff that we, I didn't have back, you know, before 2000, et cetera. And testing removes all the guesswork and it really gets people there faster, wherever there is for them, whatever they want to get to. And I just found testing to just speed things up massively and get there quicker, faster, and ultimately uh, with less time, energy, and resources invested into it. So my question for people that, when they want to talk about inflammation <clears throat> and, and us and, and, and weight. Now, now I, many people listening may not have weight as their issue, and that's totally understandable. And, but weight is really a placeholder for something that most of the people will understand either directly from personal experience or relating to someone that they, that they know and care about. And, and for some people, like the way that they, sh they show inflammation is through weight. Uh, I am someone who does not show weight through inflammation, but my inflammation doesn't go into weight. Instead, it goes into my joints for pain. It goes into my skin in the form of rashes. It goes into my brain in the form of uh, anger, depression, and insomnia. So, so inflammation is expressed in different ways for, for different people. And one of the most common ways is weight gain. And, and I just want to uh, explain why that is. And, and, and I'll, I'll explain it through uh, asking a simple test. This is what I call the muffin test. The, the muffin test is that, you know, you know, say like, do, do you, um, like, do you, is anyone here listening? Do you have this experience? Like you eat yes, a muffin. Yes, they do. <laughs> you know, okay. So you eat a muffin and you gain that day like one to three pounds, two to four pounds, or if you're in or more, you know, yeah. or more, or in the EU, we're, we're talking one to two kilos or whatever, whatever metric system is going on at the moment. I don't know. So we got, so one to two kilos 
And and now unless that muffin was last year's re-gifted Christmas fruit cake. Irish it did not Christmas fruit cake, because we use extra alcohol. <laughs> right, 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 right. Unless it didn't weigh one to two kilos, did it? It didn't weigh two to four pounds. Yeah. So so what happened? How but how is it possible this one little muffin can put on one to three, two to four pounds, one to two kilos? How is that even possible? Here's here's why. So when you eat something that's inflammatory, let's let's take this muffin. Let's say it's the sugars or the colorings or the dough conditioners or the preservatives or the the whatever other gunk that's in there or the gluten or the 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 gluten adjacent components like gliadin or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. These are things that cause inflammation in the gut system, and and then that that inflammation spreads out through the body. So. When you have inflammation, those, those inflammatory chemicals damage cells. They damage organs, they damage nerves, they damage tissues, they, they're, they're damaging. Mm. And so how does the body deal with it? Well, it retains water to do what? Dilute the damaging inflammatory chemicals. The dilution is the point. The dilution is to do what? Buy the liver and kidneys time to flush out the toxic, damaging, inflammatory chemicals out of your body. Mm -hmm. So this is why one can rapidly put on one to two kilos, two to four pounds, whatever, because your body's like, oh, that's tough. It's like, it's like the equivalent of a bee sting. Yeah. It's like a bee sting. So like when, when, when a bee stings your arm, the bee didn't inject, you know, a half liter or half quart of water and your arm swells up. It's, it's venom. And then the body has an inflammatory response to do what? Rush water in there rapidly to do what? Dilute the venom from corroding muscles, ligaments, blood vessels, nerves, and destroying and melting off your arm. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's what the, the water dilution, rapid water swelling is for, is to protect you mm-hmm. from having your precious tissues, nerves, glands, organs, muscle, et cetera destroyed. So, so I, I go into detail once so people can understand why this happens too, to let uh, assure people that the body's not stupid. The body will always prioritize your survival over your aesthetics. Mm-hmm. Always. And people don't always. like to hear that. People do no, not don't. want to, like you were preaching my language here. I am blue in the face telling people there's no way you gained five pounds from a slice of pizza. Like it's not possible in regards to body fat or even around the menstrual cycle. I'm like, that's not fat gain. You are on your cycle. A lot of that is that inflammatory fluid retention pathway, but sometimes they need to hear it from someone else because they, if you're, if you're someone's teacher, they like to think that you just want to say things to make them feel better rather than it's actually the truth. So my, uh, the, to, the t- teaching is a team sport. Mm-hmm. Teaching is a team sport. And that the seeds in the ground or the ground is made fertile through however many exposures to content, however many that's going to be. Mm-hmm. And then there can be, this has happened to me. I don't know how many thousands of times where I've, I've heard things over and over again. And then it just took someone else, just a different voice or a different angle, but eventually came back to the same thing I was told 20 years ago. Yeah. And yeah. The, 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 the goal, the objective is that just that, that the knowledge is shared and understood it and more importantly implemented uh and and however we get there on whatever timeline is however we get there and my my uh, i mean i didn't find out about genetics until like 2015 like really like and i feel like that was late and so i've made up for lost time by just like going super deep into it and really really like to the forum like like lecture to conferences and stuff (laughs) and this idea of puffy weight and particularly exercise-induced obesity. I mean, let, let's let's explain the exercise-induced obesity going back to this exact same mechanism as eating a, a, a muffin. People have this, this threshold based on their genes of how much inflammation they can take before it's too much. Because when you exercise, you're going to create some inflammation. It's going to happen. Mm-hmm. But, the, but the counter secretion of growth hormone and testosterone and other 
molecules that are anti-inflammatory and growth oriented, you know, not only minimize the effect of the inflammation from exercise, it completely balances it out and, and makes a net positive anti-inflammatory effect. But if you over-exercise, then you can basically create that toxic muffin within yourself by over-exercising. And for these people that, uh, th I mean, the, the people that this may apply to is they may, may, not, may not eat muffins, but the way you know you may have puffy weight from inflammatory water weight gain is that you, no matter how much you exercise, you still have this like watery layer over like, you know, that's your belly over your biceps. Mm -hmm. And like, there's, you, you don't have the definition, you know, you should have based on the volume of exercise you do. And I, can, uh, my best friend in graduate school, I told her you're over exercising, you're overdoing it. And she's like, no, no, no. I was like this. And I'm like, you've, and I told her, you've been complaining about how your body doesn't look the way it should for literally years. Mm -hmm. I've known, like, I've known her for 17 years now. Okay. And she finally let me do her genetics. I think it was two years ago, finally. Mm -hmm. um, and sure enough, she was an over inflamer. And I said, here's another thing for our audience to listen to if this, this may clue, clue the people this may be relevant to into that they are also an over inflamer, even if they avoid muffins. Have you ever had the experience where you had to either by choice or circumstance were unable to exercise for a week? where you normally exercise every day for an hour or blah, blah, blah. Did you notice that upon your return to the gym, you look, looked better, felt better and could lift more. Mm -hmm. And she got real quiet, <laughs> super awkward, super <laughs> awkward. And I just let her sit in her awkwardness for as the long as she <laughs> and I was so comfortable letting her sit in her awkwardness on the, on that silence. And she finally, uh, <clears throat> meekly, I might add, uh, s mumbled something about how, yeah, maybe kind of sort of, there might've been one thing, you know, recently over the summer I was traveling and, you know, the gym was closed in, in the hotel I was staying in for a week. So I couldn't exercise. And then and it was like in this environment where it was like super awful weather out and whatever. So she came back the week later and she felt better, looked better and lifted more after a week <laughs> off. And I'm like, I'm not going to say I told you, no, to hell with it. I am telling you, I told you so. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and so that's, that's what I'm talking about. Like over exercises, it can be its own inflammatory uh, overshoot. There's a so, real, sorry to cut you off, but there's a real fear though, as well of p taking a break from the gym. It's like, oh my God, I'm going to lose my gains or I'm going to gain fat because I'm not exercising and I I spoke about this last week with my clients, specifically about me. I train very hard. Now, this week is my go hard or go home week. And then I take a week or two to just rest. And every January, when I step back in the gym, someone will comment, man, you look leaner or you look buff because I gave my body the time to heal and regenerate. But also I rested and that just cortisol and everything just drops for me. Yeah. And, and rest. So when I, when I analyze people's exercise habits, I look at intensity, duration, variety, and recovery. Mm -hmm. And re recovery is the single most uh, underutilized component of exercise mm -hmm. or people. Now I have to be careful about that. It's saying that because there's people who don't do enough exercise. Yeah. And they're like, look at me, I'm just constantly recovering. It's like, no, you totally <laughs> missed the point here. Like yeah. you only recover from something you have done, yeah. not something you have not done. That doesn't count. You don't, yeah. <laughs> there nice is no perpetual, <laughs> <laughs> right? Nice try. I mean, that's impressive to, to try to you know, play the word mm -hmm. game, but no. so yeah, the, the recovery, recovery is earned when you do a thing. And if you keep doing a thing without the recovery, that's called burnout. Yes. Yeah. And burnout doesn't mean you waste away always. It can be for some people. Burnout can be you 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 puff up because you can't clear you can't clear your um your inflammatory chemicals. And uh, w one thing I want to point out really explicitly is the direct connection of genes to weight. And there's a study out of Australia. It was in May 2009 called "Weighing It Up: Obesity in Australia," where 
the the conclusion was that genetics contributes to 70 percent of the factors of someone's weight 70 seven zero and lifestyle is the other 30 now that doesn't mean that oh my god i'm doomed because mm -hmm. it's only 30 percent is contributed to lifestyle no that's actually good news because you can do a heck of a lot with your lifestyle and environment and that if you know, and then I would say it's actually more than 30% related to lifestyle and environment, because if you know your genetics and you can alter your lifestyle and environment, according to your genetics to optimize your weight and performance. So, uh, when, when working with genetics, my, um, when working with genetics, I'd say that it's very important that you work with a practitioner because uh, what happens is that if you, if you just go and do like this, like a 23 and me something like, and you just spit it into an algorithm, it's not really prioritized or organized. And, you know, more data is not better data. It's better organized and prioritized and practical data. That's better data. Mm -hmm. And when, uh, when we're looking at genes to make, because gene, genetics can be quite a heady subject. So I just want to make it a bit more simple. Think of like DNA is the library and, and the, the, the cell nucleus is in the center of the cell that has the genetic material. That's the library. And that genes are organized into chromosomes. And those chromosomes are in the library knowledge of the shelves. And then there's books on the shelf and those shelves are the bands on the DNA. And then when you open a book and lay it flat on the ground, you get a page to your left, a page to your right. And those are the recipes. Those are the actual like genes that code for proteins, a protein, like the, there's, there's a recipe for a protein there. And so once one page is mom's copy, one page is dad's copy. So you get, you, you have a book that's open and a quote, good copy is when you have the same good recipe from both mom and dad. And a quote, bad copy uh, is when you get uh, a bad copy of the recipe from both mom and dad. And that's like a red dot. The two good copies are called a green dot. And then if you get one copy that's bad and one, one copy of the recipe that's good, doesn't matter from what side, mom or dad, um, you get what's called a yellow dot. It's kind of a, a fusion. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the recipe is not, not it, it's weird because it's like this hybrid between because the body doesn't know it's like, oh, which one do I'll just kind of blend, you know, just take this, this blended thing. Yeah. And um, so the recipe is off, even though if it's one from mom, one, for, even though you do have one, one page is good. One page is not. And, and the, even if you have a quote, bad copy or a really bad copy, it, it's not bad news. Just like we showed in that weighing it up 2009 study from Australia that I made this uh, for the picture of, if you're not, if you're just listening, I have a picture here I made of a traffic light with all three lights going at the same time. So like there's a cone of red going forward a, with a cone of yellow and a cone of green, the cones necessarily spread. And so like the, the edges of the, cone, like the yellow cone will go into green territory and red territory and the red will primarily go into like further up away. And then also down into yellow territory and like a little bit into the, green territory and the green will kind of go through the yellow and it like peter out a little bit into the red, et cetera. And so what I'm saying here is that, you know, if you have a quote red dot or two bad copies of a gene, uh, you're just where you started. The starting block is behind, but if you, with a change of lifestyle, your green, your, your red dot, your, your two bad copies of the genes, you can with proper lifestyle, it can behave green like, your quote bad genes will never become quote good genes, but you can change how the bad quote bad genes behave to make them behave green like. It just requires the right knowledge and the right consistency uh, of, for lifestyle change and just doing consistently to make the red and yellow dots, these so-called bad versions of the genes behave like good genes. And that's good news. That's epigenetics. Epigenetics is is understanding that your genes are more like a dimmer switch. And if, you, if you've got a, a set of bad genes, that means that your dimmer switch is, is, is starts more on the dimmer side and, ha and, and has, takes more work to turn it up to the brighter side. Where if you have a green dot, 
then you're already starting at the brighter side and you can go up. But, you know, if you have bad lifestyle, even with a lot of green dots, you can careen backwards into something that's pretty dim. Mm-hmm. So, it is, so it goes both ways. So you can basically influence your genetic expression through right. nutrition or lifestyle changes or whatever. Correct. Absolutely. A hundred percent. And, and one, one of the best ways to influence your genes is to know what your genes say mm-hmm. and then know exactly what lifestyle changes you need to do based on your unique genetics for your health to implement the lifestyle changes you need for life. So that way your genes behave the best that they possibly can for the long term. Mm-hmm. So with, with the paradigms of genetics i just want to like make the point of the difference between a traditional healthcare model with genetics the traditional healthcare model and aligned healthcare model and then how it also applies to genetics so traditional medicine now both my parents are medical doctors as was my grandfather and uh the the western medicine is not something that i dismiss or trash or whatever as someone who's in natural quote natural medicine i just understand where it came from philosophically and historically and where it is best used today and where it is misused today Mm. and so western medicine also called quote-unquote traditional which is completely nonsense traditional medicine was actually natural medicine they just Mm. they just kind of common commandeered the word traditional which is doesn't make any sense to me anyway trying to make themselves look good so, and again, like my, it's, it's about, there's a lot of uh, power and profit and prestige in owning a medical model. And my, where the Western medicine model came from was from military medicine, it's from triage. Mm-hmm. And that is a crisis model where if you're in World War I and you've got 30 people that got injured and someone lost a finger versus someone's losing an eye, who do you take care of? the person with losing the eye, like is someone actively bleeding or is it all patched up and like, are they they able to hold it and stop it? The blood loss themselves, you know, it's a triage model. It's crisis prevention. Are, are you, or are you not in crisis? Yes or no. If you're not, please be quiet and let the next person who really needs help come forward. And so it's brilliant in the emergency room. Western medicine had the, the, one of the greatest gifts to Western medicine, uh, greatest medicine has ever gifted the world is absolute, uh, you know, just massive advances in emergency care, massive. And if they get, it's like the fire department, if they get there in time, if the fire department gets to a burning building in time and doesn't screw up in the process, they could put out the fire and save the building. Mm-hmm. And if the building, but what do you do once the fire is out? Do you call back the fire department next week to just soak it down again and chop down a few more walls, windows, or doors, you know, just in case to prevent another fire? Or do you bring in a general contractor to like rebuild rebuild and make it not only hospitable, but hopefully optimal. Now, a general contractor is utterly profoundly useless in a raging fire, <laughs> completely. And a firefighter has is no place when the building is not on fire. And so what happens is that in the in the medical models, you have the fire department, you know, which is Western medicine. And instead of fire trucks, it's ambulances. Instead of axes, it's surgery. Instead of water, it's drugs. Mm-hmm. You have the fire department now looking at the general contractor and saying, you're a waste of time, you're a fraud, you're a quack. And it's like, n- no, it's just different tools and skill set and, and an approach for different situation. Mm-hmm. So that, that, this, is, this is where the, the stress and struggle is. It's, I know where I am in the medical sandbox. I'm over in this part of it. And I know Western medicine is over in this part of it. And the problem is the encroaching of territory into the other. That's where the problem is. So uh, I I believe that everyone can get along as long as we stay in our respective roles. I have no place in an emergency room, zero, zero. I should not be in an emergency room and I have no desire to or interest to, nor should I be. Mm -hmm. So I know my place in this whole system. And I just, I'm stating that up front because genetics gets mixed into this because there's Western genetics and there's functional genetics. Western genetics is we got to find the cancer gene the heart disease gene, the osteoporosis gene, the Alzheimer's gene, the stroke gene, the diabetes gene. We got to find the gene, singular. And in functional genetics, it's not about a gene. It's about clusters of genes. 
-hmm. And Western genetics is like looking for pathology, whereas I'm looking for that dimmer switch, the functional side of things. Like there's black and white thinking in the Western genetics where it's the, the gray space, the function, the, the dimmer switch, the functional met and functional genetics. Um, and we use lifestyles instead of drugs. Uh, and we train on lifestyle and hope and optimism as opposed to a real sense of helplessness and pessimism. Oh, you got the bad gene, you're screwed. Uh, we'll see you in your deathbed in six months. Good night. Take like this medication. Yeah. Yeah. So th it's, it's th this, this paradigm turf war is also expressed in microcosm on the fight over genetics. And so I'm, I'm sharing this so that people, if you go for a genetics test from a Western trained practitioner who's looking at Western genetics, they're, they're looking at it through a completely different lens. And, you know, and, and 23andMe and Ancestry, I mentioned it briefly before, like you're, you, 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 you send in your little swab or your spit or whatever, and you punch it through some algorithm on your phone and you're just, the, the, the promises you'll be given, like, here's just a totally customized thing about your genetics. And it's going to be so practical, implementable. And you'll understand every word that's ever said to you about from this report. And you'll never be totally overblown by the hexadecimal system when they name these things. You know, it's, it's absolute garbage. Like, when people run their 23andMe or their ancestor from a health lens, they usually get overwhelmed. Uh, and they get alarmed and you're treated like an algorithm, not a person. And there's no prioritization. There's, there's no help implementing the changes. It's just, it's just a bunch of 300 generic health tips with no organization or prioritization or support and implementation. And that's the problem with just running a 23andMe and Ancestry. It's, it's just not helpful because it's overwhelming. I feel, do you, do you feel there is an aspect of, fear mongering in the 23 and me it took off for so long and i actually know several ladies that did it and got double mastectomies based on what they were told in the 23 and me and that's concerning to me yeah it, it concerns me too and that's why it's it's really ideal to work with a practitioner as opposed to with dr google mm. you know and you know, there's 50 percent of all women who who have MTHFR and never have breast cancer. And and there's other genes that are higher priorities. That I mean, we'll, we'll talk about it right now. It's like the, the, the disease gene like BRCA2, which is the one that's blamed on breast cancer. Um, that is actually quite lower down the hierarchy than the genes above it. So so the genes are in a hierarchy. Yeah. And so I don't look for the heart disease gene, the cancer gene, the stroke gene, the, the diabetes gene, the, the Alzheimer's gene, the dementia gene, et cetera. I look for what are the drivers, the genes that control the drivers of those diseases. So like th those disease genes are downstream. They get poked on when there is rampant inflammation and or problems with liver, liver detoxification or free radical damage, or they're not properly using vitamin D or the methylation system is off or their cardiovascular circulation is, is askew or that they're not properly able to burn their fats for energy and for heat. And so the drivers of diseases are, are those things I just mentioned, the things upstream, inflammation, free radical damage, liver detox, vitamin D utilization, methylation, cardiovascular circulation and fat and energy metabolism. Those are the drivers. So if the genes above are not only have multiple clusters of genes that have red and yellow dots or, or bad copies of the genes, and you have the lifestyle to provoke those red and yellow genes to behave like red and yellow genes, mm -hmm. then downstream, it will poke on the quote disease genes. And those are the genetic fault lines that express as individual diseases. So, because Two people can have identical lifestyles, identical lifestyles, but completely different health expressions because their genetic fault lines differ. You can have this, if you have the exact same terrible diet, exact same sedentary lifestyle, exact same stress, exact same sleep deprivation, exact same toxic exposure, exact lack of routines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you have people with completely separate disease processes because their genetic fault lines differ. So, but the, it's amazing is you can help them with the similar lifestyle or same lifestyle. And then you get a, you know, a, a, the seemingly separate disease processes, you know, 
go in reverse, even though they look apparently so different. So when you're choosing genetics, you want to find genetics testing that fills these four criteria. One, they focus on the drivers of disease, not the disease themselves. This is what we just talked about. Number two, we look at, of those, you look at the genes that are upstream from other genes. So for example, there's hundreds of genes that are uh, directly involved or peripheral to inflammation. I look at the top 15 because those are the ones that control the hundreds underneath. That's, I'd want to work on those. Is there a value to looking at those other ones? I'm sure there is in very specific situations. I don't do it though. I'd rather look at the top 15 that control all the rest. Then you want to look at genes that have a minimum variation, meaning that the minimum 10% of the pop normal population has red and yellow dots in those upstream driver-based genes. So I'm not looking for a 0.0001% chance of a, of a gene that's like, and, and they're, they're, that's valuable. Like there's certain very rare genetic disorders that are meaningful and terrible for those that have them. I am not testing for those. I am testing for the most common, most important upstream genes that have meaningful impact across the entire health spectrum. So and kind the of the, you're targeting the bigger genes that are going to have the biggest impact rather than messing around with the little genes. If you go for the big ones, you potentially will get a ripple effect down to the- Not potentially, you do. You, you, get a, you get a massive ripple effect. So I don't know if people have heard of Pareto's principle or the 80-20 principle, et cetera. Yeah. Like you, you look on the least amount that has the biggest impact. So I'm doing the 80-20 you know, genetic analysis. I'm looking mm -hmm. at the, sm the smallest number of most important genes that have the biggest effect on the majority of genes. That's, that's what I'm looking at. And I'm not excluding the validity importance of really niche, you know, other genes and that that's that's like kind of another that's a different layer yeah and yeah. that's important but it's for for everyone can val get value tremendous value from getting this big picture ed20 analysis and the uh, the fourth criteria to go with the the choice of genes are do, do the remaining genes have peer-reviewed research done on humans not wombats or nematodes or, or anything else that show that lifestyle, diet, exercise, nutrition alone can change the expression of the gene for the better, change that dimmer switch, make it behave more green-like. So, so those are the four criteria. Are they associated with one of the main drivers of disease? Are they upstream? Are they found in the general population, the variations found in the general population? Is there human-based peer-reviewed high-level research showing that lifestyle, diet, nutrition alone will change the behavior of said red and yellow dotted genes? That's mm -hmm. the criteria. And there's it's not that many. There's like maybe a hundred or so that fill fulfill all these genes, 100, 150 or so. Okay. So which is not which is not a lot, but it's also not it's it's those amount those numbers uh, help tremendously to know the, that core. There's about thirty thousand genes in uh, the human genome, so it's not an eighty twenty analysis. It's it's whatever one fifty divided by thirty thousand is, which is not a lot. <laughs> uh, I'm not, I can't do the math that quick in my head at this moment. Don't worry about uh, it. <laughs> so. Now I want to talk about clusters. So just just to give give a sense of how how analysis is done. So if for those of you just listening, I'm showing a picture of the exact same genes on um, once on the left and on the right. But one person, there's seven genes I'm showing about cardiovascular system. The person on the left has six out of the seven cardiovascular and blood pressure genes having green dots, and the other ones are yellow. And on the other side, I'm showing the exact same genes except this other person has six out of seven having red and yellow dots and only one green. So it's, a, it's like the opposite. And for anyone who's never studied any genetics or frankly, any health, all they, they look at this picture and they see that I've circled, I've circled the six green dots with the one re yellow versus the one that's got a bunch of, you know, six red and yellows and one green. And I ask which person is going to have the problem with blood pressure and cardiovascular health? 
and you don't have to know anything about all the the designations of AGT and AGTR1 and ENOS-2 and the NADPHCY, blah, blah, blah. It's, you don't have to know any of that. Just visually, who's going to be fine? Who do you have to worry about? The, which person do you have to worry about with cardiovascular disease and blood pressure? The one on the right with the more yellow and red. Yeah. So it's, I mean, I, that's, that's like the big, big, that's what I mean by looking at clusters of genes. Because if I was only looking at one gene and it happened to be in the person on the left with the six green dots, one yellow, and I was just only looking for that gene that happened to be the yellow dot for this person, I would assume this person, if I only had that data, this person has a really big problem potentially with their blood pressure and cardiovascular health. And the reverse is, and that's not true. And then the other, the same with the other person, if I was just looking for that one green dot to the exclusion of the other ones, uh, I would be misguided, misguided about that person's well-being when it comes to the blood pressure in their heart. And this is the same for inflammation, liver detox, methylation, your ability to burn fat for energy and, and heat, et cetera. And this is like, like we just look for groupings. So these are the 15 most important, another slide looking at the 15 most important genes for inflammation. This person. When you look at inflammation, there's three phases of initiation, sustaining, and clearing. This person over-initiated, over-sustained, and under-cleared inflammation. And so when we look at the three types of genetic-based weight gain, we're looking at, this is an example of inflammatory weight gain. This person, when, in this case, she was a, was a client of mine, she over-exercised because she went and got a new trainer without telling me. And mm -hmm. she got involved with some CrossFit enthusiast who over-exercised her. And what happened is that her muscle tone washed out and her hormones went crazy. Like she, she, her menstrual cycle went completely weird. Why? The over-exercise created lots of inflammation, which then retained a bunch of water, which then washed out the muscle tone in her arms and in her whole body. And her hormone system also, she's also genetic in her liver. She has several variations, several yellow dots that involve with estrogen metabolism. And three of her inflammatory genes that are involved in sustaining inflammation are in the liver. All three of them had yellow dots. The, the technical term is the acute phase inflammatory protein and the CRP gene. So if she's got too much inflammation from too much exercise and her liver already has a problem with excess inflammation and she's suddenly flooded with inflammation and she has also problems detoxing estrogen in her liver mm -hmm. and she's flooded with inflammation what and what, her body's going to always pick getting rid of immediate inflammatory chemicals over getting rid of estrogen so that explains why her hormones went off while she was over inflamed with all this extra inflammatory water weight now for men so, so what happens in women is that if they have this pattern where they can over exercise and they get, or they eat too many muffins or whatever, and they over inflame, they put on all this water weight. Now there can also be hormonal consequences if their this, if their liver also gets gummed up with inflammation, especially because there are problems with the genes in the liver. Plus they also have problems detoxing estrogen anyway in their liver then they develop this estrogen dominance thing, this estrogen excess so that can affect their hormone systems in women. But in men, they develop man boobs. And I had two cases, actually one of the things I lectured on in the genetics conference was exercise induced obesity. And the case studies were in men who the more they exercise, the fatter they got, and they also develop man boobs. And it's not because I have some weird fascination with man boobs, it's because I'm just observant. And I was like, huh, I wonder if their estrogen, if their estrogen detox pathways were also affected or they, and they have really poor estrogen detox capacity in their genes. And it turns out I was right. And so the way I helped these gentlemen was not telling them to exercise more and eat less. It's that I gave them a personalized lifestyle based on their genetics to get them on an anti-inflammatory liver supporting lifestyle, diet, and nutrients, have them cut down on their exercise enough without stopping exercise and increasing their recovery 
to help them drop massive amount of weight and get their and drop their man boobs, not drop off, but reduce. So <laughs> that'd be awkward. Uh, the and the same thing with with this client of mine. Uh, I have a few questions for you before we move on, just so I don't lose the train of thought. So, for instance, in regards to a man or a woman, if they have issues detoxifying estrogen, regardless of the genetic aspect with exercise, if there is maybe some scar tissue or liver damage from alcoholism or something like that, that then is going to affect their inflammatory pathways as well am i correct uh well uh, alcohol um i mean uh uh I, I recognize the irish accent so uh, uh ireland i believe has a unique relationship with alcohol yeah uh, we tolerate it very well <laughs> with t tolerating is a moving target uh of a word uh so possibly it's the national sport uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I lived in New Zealand for eight years where alcohol was also next to rugby, the national sport. <laughs> and um, so alcohol has a uniquely uh, a unique relationship with estrogen. So uh, well, so a lot of alcohols, especially beer, have estrogen in it. Mm -hmm. Additionally, alcohol increases the aroma activity, the aromatase enzyme, which converts testosterone into estrogen. And alcohol really gums up the liver, which blocks estrogen detox. So alcohol, particularly beer, because it has estrogen in it, will in three ways increase the amount of estrogen load on the body. And this is why you see men who drink a lot of alcohol, they develop man boobs and estrogen dominance. Yeah. So it's uh, so, so estrogen and alcohol have a unique relationship. Now that's just from the beer itself. And if you've got genetic vulnerabilities on top of that, that make it harder for you genetically to get rid of estrogen and also make it harder for you to get rid of inflammation, particularly in the liver. Uh, and there's other genes, which I, I haven't shown, which I haven't shown here. Well, on your ability to detox alcohol, period, the, the, uh, the, um, aldehyde, um, aldehyde, aldehyde, uh, I'm forgetting, blanking on the name of the gene. Um, forgive me, whoever's, uh, genetics nerd listening to this um the uh if you've got these additional genetic vulnerabilities then it's even harder for you to process alcohol and the consequences of it so yeah Does that answer your question? A, yeah but i have another one so i have um a client and i have looked in depth at her dutch test that was done mm -hmm. recently and then a follow-up pathology test was also done so i was able to compare both so she has estrogen dominance she's very slim lean lady she has estrogen dominance she has a very stressful job she exercises late in the evening which i don't necessarily agree on after a stressful oh, day She's very, very sensitive to swelling and fluid retention, especially if she has any sort of carbohydrates. I would guess she has either the genetics for the estrogen or pro-inflammatory because I've noticed some mental health issues as well, which would tell me inflammation in the brain too happening there. So I, as you're speaking, I'm thinking of her, but also... When I do ask her to pull back from exercise, she seems to respond better. Um, the fluid retention goes down. So then I suppose with her, what I'm asking is, and I know she's going to ask is, does that mean she can never exercise again? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. Um, and there was no alcohol involved with this person either? There was some alcoholism as well for a couple of years, but not anymore, but still some alcohol pops in sometimes. I mean, I can, everything you're saying screams this woman and she has estrogen dominance as well, even though most people when they, of course, you and myself would know better, but a lot of people, when they think of estrogen dominance, they think of overweight, obesity, but this woman is very lean. She's very slim but she will blow up with fluid retention and it'll stay for three or four days. Yeah. So, so a couple, couple terms to get clarity on it. And, and I realize for the people listening, they may not be familiar with the Dutch test. 
And, and some the term estrogen dominance is a technical term. Right? When, you, when you say estrogen dominance, you're talking about like her, the, the, the ratio of her hormethoxy to 16. Uh, yeah, 16, so she uh, had higher on. Mm-hmm. So is she it had higher, higher estrogen and pretty much zero progesterone, almost okay. zero DHEA. I mean, it, it's a bit of a shit show because her testosterone was insane in the 500s. So it's like was she, was she taking an exogenous DHEA or pregnenolone or testosterone? Testosterone. Drug? Okay, so she's pro- what's probably happening is she's aromatizing all of that testosterone she's taking exogenously, and it's just rapidly turning into, or, or a good chunk of it is in, is turning it into estrogen. And um, if she's well, she's taking an estrogen blocker as well. To um, try to prevent the aromatase from happening. I mean, it's a very complicated situation. Yeah, it sounds it sounds very complicated, and I'm not sure why she would be wanting to take that much testosterone in the first place. Uh, and uh, unless she's got, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it sounds like I, I don't know if she's trying to perform for some sort of sport. It was or to preserve to muscle and try to gain muscle, but also the, I think a part of it was the mental calmness from having some testosterone too. Okay. So in, in this, and again, we're not just for people listening, like we're not establishing a treatment plan or, or, yeah. or some sort of clinical relationship here for this person. We're just using this as a case study for purposes of discussion. Um, so ask what what remind me your your specific question about her again well i would assume that she does have some genetic um traits for not just the estrogen detoxification but also the inflammatory pathways too i i feel she's extra extra sensitive to inflammation but her lifestyle is a trigger it's spiraling out of control oh yeah Totally. And when the, the thing that, that stands out to me that she's hypersensitive or, or sorry, hyper vulnerable to trivial amounts of inflammation is the rapid blowing up of, of weight rapidly. Mm-hmm. Cause it's yeah. not from yeah. it's, it's, I mean, unless she's, unless she's e- eating six pizzas in a, in a half hour sitting, there's no way you put on that amount of weight unless it's from inflammatory water retention. And, and it is. Mm-hmm. And the and her lifestyle doesn't sound supportive of her weight and health goals, but so I'm not sure. And, and mindset, as you know, as a coach, like you know, we we we're half of the battle is helping clients with their mindset of being willing to change their lifestyle in a way that they don't view as a sacrifice and some sort of meaningful sacrifice for something else. Because some people. You know, if I work with, with some people who are just like diehard professionals and in, in whatever their professions, like if I ask them to change their lifestyle in a way they think their profession is going to be jeopardized mm-hmm. or for some people and they think something else may be jeopardized. And the answer is like, this is not a game of deprivation uh, to try to shoehorn you into a better lifestyle for your health at the expense of that something else. It's a collaboration. It's how can we make sure that you achieve the rest of your life goals and retain lifestyle and way of living you want without you self-destructing. Yeah. And then having, and then working in a way that we find the, the easiest, most effective, highest value lifestyle changes, the fewest number of them that will give you the most benefit, which is where the genes are really valuable. Because if I can, like, for example, if I'm looking at this person who uh, over initiates, under sustains, oh, sorry, over initiates inflammation, over sustains inflammation, under clears inflammation. I don't want to give her nine separate lifestyle changes for each gene. I want to find the one to five lifestyle changes that each of them help six to nine uh, or uh, of the genes at once. So she's getting look, one lifestyle change can help the majority, if not all, all of the the genes and the second one will affect most and if not all the genes in a slightly different way so that i don't need to give i don't need to give that many things to do in order to help the genes in a massive massive way mm-hmm. and for for the woman that i described where she was over exercising and getting inflamed and her hormones went off uh, i recalibrated her lifestyle had some very choice words about her 
CrossFit trainer and told her she has to go down to twice a week max Mm -hmm. with at least a two days of rest in between each session to give her body real rest because she's an over inflamer and too much exercise will hurt her. So it can't be every day exercise for her. It was every three days, you know, just twice a week, which freed up a massive amount of time for her. And I changed her diet according to her genes, changed other aspects of her lifestyle as well, as well, according to her genes and her muscle tone returned her hormones uh, rebalanced. She had her menstrual cycle back normally. She got her figure back and she was able to exercise in a way that was sustaining her and not hurting her. So, and what, and this is just an example of visually, this is not, people shouldn't like copy this, but this is an example of her, how I can rank order what type of lifestyle changes people need to do based on which genes have, which lifestyle chains have the most number of uh, research papers for the most number of genes. So it's like, I can pick one lifestyle change and it affects nine out of 20 genes versus one that has 14 out of those 20 odd genes. I would want to pick the one who does the 14 first, because that affects the most number of red and yellow genes. So I customize this to people mathematically. It's, it's a very, it's, it's a very mathematical, precise scientific approach to how do you pick what lifestyle changes to use? It's whatever lifestyle change helps the most number of the highest priority genes. That's it. As opposed to the 23andMe approach, which is we're just gonna give you all of the changes and have no prioritization or organization or implementation to support you with, which is nonsense. So the other thing I wanna point out here is like getting your genetics done is one thing, but having coaching support is the other half of the equation. I really encourage people, if you're going to do genetics with someone, you do it with an established coaching program that is baked into your genetics. The only people that I have ever felt truly comfortable just giving the data and they will implement everything on their own with no support have been professional multi-decade bodybuilders, Mm -hmm. disciplined people, very, very, very disciplined. They know how to implement yeah, totally fine. Just running the test and giving them the info. And like, you know, let me know if you have a problem and yeah. they will. And yeah. like, yeah. Uh, like the questions they have are super specific. Wow. Super yeah. nuanced. So, um, so there, but most people are not cyborgs. They're not like that. So get, get the coaching support. And, and there's, there's a bunch of genetics aside from just inflammation. I just want to touch on a couple more. That's really important. So, the, we've talked about inflammatory weight gain and the seven drivers of disease. Now we talked, so, so like inflammation does is more than just weight. It's way, um, way, 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 more than just weight. It's about quote, stopping the clock end quote of the effects of aging. It's longevity, health and well-being, And it's also future proofing your brain. My father, MD, PhD, two-time author, MacArthur Genius Award recipient has dementia. He has a terrible lifestyle and is the worst patient ever, the worst, and (laughs) will not listen to his son about any of this stuff. And he's just on the rapid descent because he refuses to stop his pro-inflammatory lifestyle and his brain is just rotting, rotting off the vine. And if, you know, what, what causes damage to the brain? Inflammation, free radical damage, toxic buildup poor vitamin D utilization, methylation issues, circulation issues, like uh, the uh, neurodegeneration has also been dubbed, quote, type three diabetes, end quote, type three Mm -hmm. diabetes. So what that means is that your diet absolutely affects the quality of your brain. And my father, they just don't think what they're putting in their mouth or if they're staying up all night watching Netflix instead of sleeping that they may actually be causing brain damage right yeah so you don't you don't need to play rugby to get brain damage you can do it watching rugby too late yeah <laughs> I never put that together that's why I could play watching funny. rugby and eating Doritos like that's yeah, a sure yeah, way yeah. to kill your brain so th- there's many there's many ways to kill your brain all sorts of entertaining ways that are self-destructive. Um, 
And uh, so, so working on infl inflammation for as one of the drivers, of, that alone will help all these other aspects, longevity, aging, future proofing your brain, et cetera. That's now, actually, I'm sorry again to cut you off, but that's actually what I was going to ask you or say. Anytime I ever work with anyone, my first approach is always to push down inflammation, regardless of what the goal is. So you, what I'm gathering from you is that really is the top tier. Inflammation is going to have a big impact on everything else. So, so genetically, um, the, even the drivers are hierarched, uh, have a hierarchy to them. Mm -hmm. So, so inflammation is the major control is, is the major one. Then underneath it is free radical damage scavenging. This is, this is scavenging free radicals, particularly the mitochondria, the gene for the, for the nerds out there. It's MNSA, GPX1, and catalase, CAT. Those are the three main genes that, that create the enzymes to convert free radicals in the mitochondria back into oxygen and water. And then underneath those are the major liver detox genes. Uh, mm -hmm. There's eight uh, major ones, three for phase one, five uh, for phase two. Again, I don't want to get too into the weeds yeah. here. Uh, then you've got the vitamin D receptors, and then you've got a whole river of methylation genes. And it's not just MTHFR. That's one methylation related gene and on the gene test that I run. There's like 15 methylation genes on there. And, uh, but inflammation is more important as a priority than methylation. Mm -hmm. So when people say, Oh my God, I'm MTHFR. I'm doing like, no, you're not work on the inflammatory genes first and the free radical ones and like, and we'll get to methylation, like just stop freaking out about your MTHFR, your precious MTHFR genes. It's not that precious. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of other stuff. It's a higher priority. It's important, but it's not precious. And then the cardiovascular genes, it's like there are, there, there's, there's rank ordering, even of yeah. the genes themselves. So inflammation is a great place to start. Mm -hmm. um, then we've got how to find your ideal diet. So now we've got the technology to identify, are you keto, paleo, Mediterranean, or high carb diet. We can figure this out now. And it has to do with not, this is the one exception to the variation rule where it's the number of duplicates of a gene. It, it's, the, it's the number of cannons lining the fort. If you've got a cannon that spits out uh, a number of Pac-Man-like enzymes to break down carbohydrates, but you've got another fort that's got 10 cannons, that person can break down 10 times as much carbs as the other person. So this is the number of duplicates of the gene. And in my case, like <laughs> I have, I had a, I had a perfect Portlandia Mediterranean diet where I knew the names of my farmers and their chickens and the quinoa was grown in the mountains by left-handed monks who sung low tones on the full moon, you know, all of this stuff, all of this hippie stuff. And it wasn't a quality issue. It was a quantity issue. I'm actually the second lowest carb tolerance you can have. I'm basically an Inuit you know, and like, well, I have a super low carb tolerance. And so when I switched my diet to a totally organic local Mediterranean diet to like a local organic, you know, paleo straddling keto diet, my digestive problem, my digestive system problem of 20 years just went away within a week, one week. It was a quantity issue, not a quality issue. Now I understand not everyone can get local organic. I get that, mm -hmm. but you can control the number of carbs if you know your carb number, then you can know if you are a keto, paleo, Mediterranean, or high carb. High carb people exist, just like paleo, it's like keto people exist. Mm -hmm. I had one guy who was a, who's, plays almost like amateur tennis, like he's built like, like and, and he was keto shamed into going keto because all of his buddies were doing keto and he was like fainting on the court. And I told him in no circumstances are you to ever be keto because genetically he was an 11. Out of like he was a super high carb, you know, like it, and and he's and he's like, oh my, that makes so much sense, mm -hmm. like because he feels awful, like awful on a low carb diet. We're when he was fainting, and but his buddies have a way low carb tolerance, and they're just doing great, riding high on keto, you know. Mm -hmm. So people need to find out what their optimal diet is, what their carb tolerance is, and then there's trigger foods. Alcohol is on this list of trigger foods. So is your relationship to, to lactose, to gluten, to salt. So salt is not just about blood pressure, but salt is actually another mechanism to water retention. Some people, when they have too much salt, they don't have high blood pressure, but they have water retention. 
if you have like puffy weight and that also may be salt retention. It mm. also may be histamine intolerance. People can have genetic intolerance to histamine. That also may be a cause of water retention. Now, for me, when I looked at my trigger foods, the big find was that I had, quote, caffeine-induced anxiety and depression. Please. Don't tell anyone. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so whenever I lecture to entrepreneurs, I mean, I'm lecturing a group of entrepreneurs, and I say, some of you may be genetically vulnerable to caffeine-induced anxiety and depression, but you conflate anxiety for energy, and you can hear the collective sphincter of the room clench in fear that, oh my God, I don't want to, he's telling me to give up coffee. My whole business, my whole life, everything will be ruined. I'm like, just calm down, unclench, it'll be fine. Like, this is, like, it's the reality. I, I am super sensitive to caffeine. I was in total denial about it. I thought if I just put enough coconut oil in it, I'll be bulletproof, you know? No, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. I was still a jittery, anxious mess when I had caffeine. So I've switched to coffee alternatives. I know that sounds terrible to some of you. And this is 2022, soon to be 23 at the time of this recording. This is in 2002. There's mm. way better alternatives out there. There's You'll awesome. be fine. Mm. You'll be fine. Okay. So this changed my life, as did finding out that I was a paleo straddling keto. Changed my life in terms of my diet and my mood. Your person... I don't know if your person drinks a lot of coffee. I'm guessing. One a day, but she's very sensitive to salt, like extremely sensitive, like a pinch and she, her, all her appendages just swell her ankles. Well, swell. yeah, see, I, I just, yeah, absolutely. Her, her, so, so some, she's, she may have inflammatory sensitivity plus salt sensitivity. She also may have histamine sensitivity. She may have all three, just like, boom, like a balloon. And some liver detoxification issues. <clears throat> sure. Like the whole, the, she, may, she may have just, you know, it's just a river of red dots. We, we, we don't know until we check. Yeah. Um, and the great, and so the great thing about doing genetics is that it's inarguable. So, so when I do like, when I look, I run Dutch tests on people or, or gut tests or, or, or ion panels for mitochondria or, 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 or metals tests and metal, and some people like, some people like look at their functional tests. So like, well, like, especially looking at their adrenals, like, oh, it's just stress that day or whatever. And, and they, they kind of like argue around it or they'll say, well, I was eating this, blah, 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 and, and whatever. But you look at someone's genetics test, they can't argue. They, they mm. literally can't. And it's so clear what people need to do from the genetics. And like my, when pe if people are really stubborn or in denial, I was both, uh, about certain lifestyle changes, but they see their genetics just like it was with me and my diet and me with coffee when it was writ large on my genetics, I'm like, well, well, that's different. And I can't deny that. And I had to change. Uh, otherwise, I was kidding myself. So I, I couldn't, it's it, genetics makes it genetics testing is one of the fastest ways for people to mentally get over the need to do a lifestyle change. It, it's, it's just it's the, like here, this is it. This is your blueprint. Now it's up yeah. to you if you want to change and optimize that, or if you want to stay where you are and deal with the Alzheimer's and damaging effects later. Right. I mean, you can try to argue with it. I mean, it'd be adorable to watch you try, but you, you, I mean, here it is. Like, here's the debate. I mean, I had, I, I talked going about the alcohol. Like this, this, this happened in when I had a physical clinic back in New Zealand and I was running these genetic success. I had a gentleman uh, who's in uh, who's in real estate, and he, and, and I knew from analyzing his lifestyle that he was an alcoholic. He was a function, high, very high functioning alcoholic, and I was waiting for the results of the genetics to come back before I had that conversation with him, because it's way easier with data mm -hmm. than to confront. Okay, so and I and I was like preparing myself. How am I going to talk about this? Like this is okay. This is like this is a thing, and so he comes into my office. And I first hand him the genetics report and I'm like talking and he doesn't even listen to me. He just like flips the pages and he goes straight to the liver section. He knew. Yeah. And he just stared. You're right. He just stares at it quietly. And my intuition was like, just shut up. Don't say anything. Just shut your mouth. Just be quiet. And I'm like, and I, in my head, I'm like, oh, okay. Well, so just, I just sat there and just let him sit there staring at this thing for i don't remember how long it was but it was not a it was not a short amount of time 
And then he said, he spoke first. He said, quote, I guess this means I have to give up alcohol, doesn't it? And I said to him, first off, I picked my job off the ground. But after that, I said, <laughs> in your case, because of your genetics, yes. Then we had the discussion about cutting out alcohol. He he was he went because he saw the data clear as day. And it just made the conversation so seamless. And he was able to change his life from did that. He? Just did he? Yes, he did. Yeah. Right. He he cut down, he radically cut down his alcohol. Um he gave him, I, I recall he gave himself the allowance of like holidays with family, which yeah. for anyone who's a daily drinker, I'm like, great, that's progress. Let's, let's do that. You know, as long as you don't black out drunk or change your personality, then. As long as it's not a binge on Christmas day. <laughs> yeah. As long, as long as you don't put you and yourself in danger or shift your personality. That, that's, that's actually my, my metric for if someone's drinking too much aside from like draining the coffers of their, but like, does their personality change? Are they dangerous to themselves or others? Whether it's driving or physically or whatever. That that's my thing. I don't like being around people who drink if they change their personality or are dangerous to themselves or others. This is that client as well. I was speaking of even one or two drinks and it's drama everywhere. Tears. Recalling you got one, the past. two drinks. One or two drinks, that is a really compromised liver. Yeah, that's what concerns me. I I don't drink too much, but the, I've seen all angles being Irish, and I've always said, if I drink, I'm the happy drunk. I just, I'm mm -hmm. happy-go-lucky, no issues at all. But it really stood out to me when I saw her after having a few drinks, and it was arguments and tears and just it was it's whole uh, but then the next day once or two days later once the liver is detoxified she's a whole new person again and she's yeah. laughing and smiling um and that really stood out to me that there was damage there yeah so uh the genetics uh, alcohol you know it depends on what culture you're in you know irish culture is, is is a drinking culture just like new zealand culture is and australian culture and northern european culture like there, there's there's several cultures that it's really ensconced and if people are concerned about alcohol then um genetics is one way to really meaningfully non-judgmentally no try to address the issue you know so then just th there's other genetics that are involved as well like eating behaviors you know some people that they overeat is genetic that they just the signal from stomach fullness is not felt in the stomach fullness is felt in the brain from a signal from the stomach mm -hmm. so sometimes people genetically just don't feel full and there's if you are a red dot in satiation or, or satiety feeling which is the, the nerdy word for not slow full response there's things that you can do. Other people have genetic aversion to bitter foods, which means that if they're averse to bitter foods, they don't eat healthy green vegetables. So mm -hmm. there's things to do to make food taste better. You change your environment. There's four separate ways to make bitter foods more palatable that I give to my red and yellow dots for bitter taste perception people. So you can change your environment, not, not you know, you don't have to relive your your five-year-old aviation themed food trauma here comes the plane of like this brussels sprout that's being thrown in your face like you don't have to relive that you can you can change how you flavor your foods even if you have a genetic variation that makes bitter foods really taste gross and then there's people who are genetically vulnerable to sweet tasting and like some people's sugar cravings are genetically wired and there's things you can do for that mm. Then there's vitamin D absorption, like how well you absorb vitamin D. I found for people who struggle with really chronic health issues, this is like 99% of people, 99 plus. I have so rare for me to find someone who has a chronic issue that does not have a double red or a double yellow in their vitamin D receptors. Almost mm -hmm. never have I found it. And I actually went back to the the chief scientists and i asked i showed i told him my pattern recognition i was like dude i think 
I want you to check the database and your other top clinicians who use these genetics, check their vitamin D receptor one and vitamin D receptor two, and check to see if chronic disease is associated with a very, very, very ridiculously high correlation of red and yellow dots in the VDR1 and VDR2. He came back to me, says, you're absolutely right. Because you're absolutely right. There's a super high correlation. Why? Vitamin D controls up to 5% of your entire genome, up to 5%, one stupid molecule. Mm. Uh, and what is the main function of vitamin D? It's not calcium and bone building, though that is a function. The main function of vitamin D is anti-inflammation yeah. and immune system modulation. Mm. That's right, I, so, I see it all the time. Yeah. I whenever I see any sort of inflammatory response from a client or pain, sore hip or whatever, I will super dose their omega trees. Uh, I tend to recommend pure krill oil, which I've seen work the best, but I will super dose their D3. I'll say let's hit that 10,000 mark for a few days till that inflammation starts to drop. Yeah, and I would encourage people who are listening not to just go out and just you know set up an iv drip of krill oil and vitamin d like yeah work with a practitioner um and my you know the but the overall theme of dropping inflammation is a wise one in 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 usually all cases there um we won't get into the nuances of where that's not the case but uh very rarely i do see it where under inflammation causes a problem that's a really rare circumstance and by the way people that wasn't all inflammation bad no Inflammation is like cortisol. Cortisol is too much cortisol will completely destroy your life. But if you don't have enough cortisol, you actually die because you can't maintain blood sugar if you're under stress. Yeah. The point of inflammation is the following. Let's, let's save the reputation of inflammation a bit so we see why the function is there. So if the point of inflammation is if I'm a hunter gatherer way back in my ancestry and I'm out there trying to hunt a really large animal with a really tiny stick. And there's a bunch of us try with all our little tiny sticks trying to take down a giant animal with hooves, horns, teeth, and claws, and fangs, and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, if I get bit, <laughs> what is a bite? <clears throat> a bite on my arm. What is a bite? A bite is tissue damage plus the injection of pathogens, inject the infections. So what does inflammation do? It rushes in blood, which is red blood cells to repair the damage and white blood cells to kill the infections that were just injected into my rendered flesh. So if I have an exuberant inflammatory response, I am more likely to survive short term a flesh wound if I have a really strong inflammatory response compared to my lesser inflammatory prone hunting party member. That person with the lesser inflammatory response will not survive the short term, but if they do, they will survive me long term. Do you see the difference? Because they're less likely to develop the inflammatory-based chronic diseases, but they will survive less the inflammatory response needed injuries. And that's, that's why there's so much variation in inflammation because that's how selection works in evolution. Nature doesn't care about you as an individual at all. It cares about the lineage. Mm -hmm. So it creates all this variety because the environmental landscape changes and the adaptability through the variety is the name of the game of sexual selection and evolutionary theory. So why is it that so many people have all these, quote, bad inflammatory genes? It's because it's a mismatch of how we live today versus what our genes developed in as hunter gatherers. So I am very pro inflammatory. That would have been great as a hunting party member and terrible in today's environment where there's almost no actual physical damage. And that's why we've got all these inflammatory based diseases is because we are not in the environment where having ex exuberant inflammation was a short term advantage. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So let's, I'm trying to like, when I saw my, when I saw my genetics report, I literally cried for an hour because it was so bad. I had only this past summer was I dethroned from having the worst genes of any gene report I have ever seen. I was dethroned only recently. Lucky me. I'm a silver, silver medal now. So <laughs> um, like, there's someone worse than me. But, but I cried. Well, I, the, I cried for two reasons. One, it finally explained why I was so sick growing up. Yeah. 
because I was just this inflammatory mess. Of those 15 inflammatory genes, guess how many I have as red and yellow dots? 15. 13. 15. I have, I don't think I've ever seen anyone with 15 out of 15. I've seen one person with 14 out of 15. So when the 15 comes along, you'll be bronze. Right. <laughs> Lucky me. Lucky them. Um, <laughs> so my, and by the way, I look at more than just those 15 genes in the genetics. Obviously I look at over 60 of the one profile and dozens of, like there's, there's, I look at over about a, something like over a hundred genes. I can't remember. I haven't counted recently, but the, the, the point being is that inflammation does have a purpose. We're just mismatched in today's day and age. That's why in anti-inflammatory regimes work so well on average for most people in most cases for most issues is because of that. Most people are not getting bit by a saber tooth tiger, but they're experiencing all this other stress, toxins, food, work, exercise, Correct. lack of sleep, and that's initiating the same response. Absolutely. So the other genes involved look at our immunity genes, whether it's like vitamin C and um, vitamin C and zinc and some other, a bunch of other stuff as well. And then to do the genetics packages is, is really straightforward. It's like getting the appropriate lab analysis with the appropriate practitioner and they're just simple cheek swabs. And it, it's, it can be done. It, it doesn't like, it doesn't, really matter where people are in the world because of shipping and it's just like a cheek swab thing so it's really stable on shipping and getting the suite of genetics labs done together as opposed to piecemeal because different labs answer different questions you know diet whether it's like are you are you keto paleo mediterranean high carb are are you vulnerable to gluten lactose alcohol histamine salt uh, other food allergens etc are you genetically vulnerable to overeating over uh, overeating in general, over craving sugar, aversion to bitterness, other things. Do you absorb vitamin D correctly? How's your immune support genes? Where are you with your inflammation, free radicals, methylation, liver detox? That's when they achieve your natural weight, aka your health and well-being, aka future proof your brain, etc. And you know, testing. Testing. Is there a gene that will indicate if you absorb more calories or how you retain them or how you burn calories? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's in the Achieve Your Natural Weight. There's actually 16 genes that relate to fat and calorie uh, metabolism. Uh, so like, like yeah, there, there's a bunch there just for time's sake. I, it's yeah. not worth going into the details, but there's 16 genes that relate to just that. Yeah, but there is genes that will influence how well you burn, how well you store, Correct. how well you utilize, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I mean, like like you, like you, for some people, like the UCP genes are the main genes identified with converting caloric fat into heat, mm. which is different than five major genes. Like it's, I think it's ADR beta two and ADR beta three, um, uh, the leper one, uh, L L L A P R. Well, there's a couple of just five genes that are convert caloric fat into energy, which are different from the genes that convert caloric fat into heat. Okay. And, um, so the, then there's the genes that how well you port and store fat and like kind of, and then there's, then there's how well you burn it. So, yeah. oh yeah, there, there, there are 16 genes there. Um, so other things I just want to talk about testing is that that testing ultimately saves you long term way more time and way more money. So th these are the things that people are concerned about with testing. Like, oh my God, it's going to be such a take so much time, and it's going to cost me so much. And the answer is, long term, this is a, a bargain. So particularly with genetics, genetics is the only type of test where the data doesn't decay over time. You do, in a, you do a Dutch test, you do a, a, a okay. mitochondria test, you do a stool test, the value of the data tr value drops precipitously after six months, especially after a year. Then you just use it for a comparison, a historical comparison, which is, which is valuable, totally valuable, but you're not going to make clinical decisions based on a lab test you did of that nature three years ago. It's not gonna, you're not going to do that. Genetics, the data is the same, it, 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 it's for life. So it saves you a huge amount of time and especially money because no matter what you invest in genetics, amortized over the next 30, 40, 50 years, it's nothing. And the value you get out of it is massive because it's it's for life. Mm -hmm. So I just, I, I just want to assure people that it's worth the investment. Just think about all the money people save by not wasting it on incongruent diets, 
Band-Aid supplements, uh, weird programs that aren't related at all to your unique genetic composition. It is so worth it. And for you know the people, and, and his, one other thing I want to share, if people do genetics and they're implementing, implementing, and they're kind of, they hit this plateau and it's not quite working the way, like it stopped working as well as it should. There's an answer to that. And that's functional testing. So mm -hmm. that you can have your genes wrapped in what I call metabolic barbed wire. So if someone's genetically keto, but they have a problem locally, like keto, high fat diet, but if they have a problem with their gallbladder or their pancreatic lipase or their mitochondria to burn the fat or the carnitine shuttle to shuttle fat into the mitochondria, they can, they, they're keto genetically, but they can't do fat metabolically yeah. yet. Yeah. So you've got to first deal with the metabolic barbed wire by, by defanging that barbed wire, dealing with the fat metabolism first, which may require a different diet, different lifestyle, et cetera, temporarily. Then you come back in with the genetics. Mm -hmm. So, so if you do the genetics and you implement the lifestyle and stuff isn't working out as much as you'd hope, or you hit a plateau, don't worry. That means that you've got some sort of metabolic barbed wire wrapping your genetics that has to be investigated. The opposite is also true. If you're high carb genetically, yeah. but you have, have a candida infection, eating high carbs is going to feed the candida, make it bloom. You're going to feel terrible. Yeah. But if you yeah. eat low carbs, you're going to feel terrible because it doesn't match your genetics. Yeah. So you got to deal first with the candida, then you go back to your genetics. So the, the type, and, and I'm, we don't have time to go into all of this as a separate podcast, Yeah. but well, there's, there's, there's the different types of testing. There's hormone testing, which is like adrenals, sex hormones, and thyroid. There's gut testing, which is looking at the major gut, the gut infections, digestion, immune system, SIBO and food sensitivities. Then there's the big field of mitochondria, brain and liver testing. And then there's like the things you don't want to see in your chronic test, which is like mold, metals, and Lyme. So those are the four major types of tests, hormone, yeah. Yeah. gut, mitochondria, and the bad, the really bad stuff. And that's a whole separate discussion, but I just wanted to briefly mention it. So people know like, oh, there's these other categories of functional testing. We mentioned Dutch here just recently. So uh, clearly your audience is familiar with, with at least some of these tests. Yeah. And there is a lot. And it's, it's overwhelming for sure when it comes to the testing aspect. Yeah. It's more than people would like. People would like the magic pill, but unfortunately, it's not that easy. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say that the, the type of testing everyone can do and get, get li literally a lifetime of value out of is genetics. Whether someone's chronically unwell or feeling normal, just wants to maintain, or some aspirational biohacker, entrepreneur, high-performance enthusiast. Genetics is like the place where everyone can benefit and have that benefit just roll forward for a very, very long time, the rest of their life. And for people that are interested in learning more about what I do, um, I have a free ebook on genetics as well as the functional tests and my a separate conversation, my model for health called the 10 pillars of health. There's a free ebooks on my website, drsamshay.com. And also at the time of this recording, if people want to speak to me directly to see if what they've got going on is their proper candidate for the type of, you know, testing genetics or otherwise that I do mm -hmm. at this time of this recording, I'm still doing those uh, health strategy calls personally, and you can schedule those. It's a, at this time of this recording, a free, uh, a free call you can schedule on my website and I'd be happy to help anyone that uh, believes they're a true candidate for this type of in-depth testing. And I will put all your links up in the description. I don't think, I mean, I think we're going to need a follow-up, but right now I don't think I have any questions because there's so much for here for people to absorb. I knew there was going to be, though I knew you were a wealth of knowledge. Um, I really hope people are kind of taking away some of the key stuff especially again, the inflammation, the food retention, genetics plays a big part. If genetics is a thing, it doesn't mean doom and gloom. It just means you might have to work a little bit harder than the person next to you. Um, and then genetic testing, if you really want the answers is the way to go. Absolutely. Uh, my, uh, 
the, the message of functional medicine is empowerment. Mm -hmm. How can you be empowered with data? I call functional medicine the, the best of Western medicine diagnostics with the best of natural medicine lifestyle intervention. Mm -hmm. That's functional mm -hmm. medicine. You get the best of both worlds. And it's, it's really the, the future of medicine is this. This, this, this is, we are literally talking the future right here. Yeah. And it starts with, it starts with people. It just starts, starts with testing, it starts with testing and then it's followed up with coaching. Everything has its place, Western, Eastern, the whole lot, it has its place. It's just using it properly is what we yeah. need to learn. Well, thank you for your time. This is a long conversation. We will have to do a number two. <laughs> second one sometimes the irish lingo just says stuff and then i realize what i'm saying well in in your defense um i did in your defense my model the 10 pillars of health the second pillar number two is bowel care so <laughs> we can we can have that 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 fun discussion on the next uh podcast. I've, I've had to adapt so much in how i speak and people still say what what are you saying? Or if I say Connor, or I say estrogen, you say estrogen, and it's just always trying to call myself out. Yes, just tell them your Irish is showing. That's all. Yeah. And anyway. I'll tell my genetics are showing. All right. <laughs> all right well thank you for your time this was a pleasure i will be in touch real soon i hope you have a great christmas and thank you for that that was just like i need i need to go have a drink <laughs> okay so hopefully it's not alcohol that'd be yeah. ironic <laughs> thank you bye, bye. bye. Thank you.